Dale Swampy. I'm a member of the Samson Cree Nation. Samson Cree is one of the four Muscogee Cree nations in uh, the Muscogee area, which is about 100 kilometers south of Edmonton. <clears throat> we have um, probably about 9,000 members. Um, we're quite a rich band in terms of uh, nationally, probably one of the richest bands. We've accumulated our income from the Bonnie Glen deposit near Pigeon Lake, which was one of the biggest pro, pro, uh, deposits in North America. <clears throat> uh, it was discovered in the 1950s. We um, accessed about $2 billion in royalties since the 1950s. Um, we have now about a billion dollars in assets, including a trust company, insurance company, 28 corporations. We're one of the uh, we're the second largest private landowner in Alberta, <clears throat> and we um, we also have a half a billion dollar um, trust fund that uh, we incorporated after uh, after Chief Chief uh, Victor Buffalo um, uh, retired. That was basically his legacy. <clears throat> Chief um, Wilton Littlechild is actually one of the directors for our trust fund, so we're quite quite proud of that. Um, so we are pretty pretty much steeped in the oil and gas industry. A lot of our community members uh, live and work in, in, in the oil, uh, oil and gas industry. And <clears throat> so we, we got a lot of exposure from that. After I got out of college in the early, early 80s, I started working with my band, uh, worked with them for 22 years. I left there as CEO. I was recruited by Chief Roy Whitney at the time, just resigned in 2001 from his band um, after his son died and started a consulting company in 2002 and recruited me around 2004. Um, he was asked by um, Enbridge to assist him in the Fort Hills project and to develop a engagement and consultation uh, department within Enbridge. Enbridge hadn't built a pipe for almost 20 years and uh, uh, needed to, um, you know, revamp their consultation department. So we helped them do that. So we got transferred from Port Hills. It was canceled and worked on the Alberta Clipper and Southern Lights project. Um, that project went from, you know, drawing board to uh, first day of operations within less than six years, a little over five years. And um, the first day of operation was 2010. That's the kind of um, uh, system that we had back then. Uh, the regulatory process was still onerous compared to other countries, but we were able to get the project like that built in, in uh, a little over five years. So after that project, <clears throat> I was honored by the Dakota Sioux tribe with their biggest um, uh, honor, which was their um, horse medallion, which is a, um, a gift to uh, other First Nation members for community support. So I was quite proud of that. We got transferred to the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Uh, Enbridge was a part owner in that along with nine producers. We took over um, engagement and consultation from Roger Harris and his team. Roger is a ex uh, MLA from the Skeena region. And um, he had, was working on a project for about five years, almost six years. Couldn't get a grasp on uh, indigenous partnerships. So we, we took over then. I was the director for the BC region we were able to get the um, uh, communities to sign on to an ownership package, which included 10% ownership equity, free equity in the project, Northern Gateway. And in the end, we ended up having the communities own uh, 33 and a third percent of the project, 15% of which is gifted, and uh, over $2 billion in, in benefits that were going to come to them for over a 30 year period which included a $200 million employment and training fund that would be managed by the uh, Aboriginal equity partners, they call themselves. That was 31 chiefs and Métis leaders and $200 million for community investments, uh, <clears throat> over a billion dollars in contracting opportunities and over $600 million in uh, uh, funds they would receive as owners of the pipeline. They also, uh, the owners group also committed to hiring a First Nation person from BC to become the CEO of the project uh, within five years of operation. So as you can imagine, all of the chiefs were pretty excited about moving forward on this. 
um, the Métis leaders as well. So when Trudeau canceled the project in November 2016, a lot of the chiefs were pretty beside themselves and they wanted to sue the federal government. Instead, we formed what we call the National Coalition of Chiefs. And we formed the um, organization to send a message out to uh, uh, First Nations across the country and natural resource proponents that coalitions are the model to use because you can maximize your benefits and you can maximize certainty for, for proponents. And we started to do that as, as we move forward. We, we also added on another mandate and that was to uh, eliminate on-reserve on poverty, to fight against on-reserve poverty. We believe that on-reserve poverty is the, the cause for all of our social ills, whether it be um, racism, murdered missing indigenous women, drug and alcohol abuse, teenage suicides, everything that uh, comes from um, the problems that we have within our communities comes from poverty. Our people that live on the reserve do not have access to economic develop, development opportunities. Um, in uh, in our own band, Samson, uh, there's no uh, employment opportunities. You pretty much have to move off to reserve and work in the oil field, in different areas and so forth. There are there are oil and gas operators, field operators, and gas plant operators around our region, but but they're limited in terms of um, you know the size of our community and uh, the uh, people that want to work. So if you're living on a reserve, you have no employment opportunities. So most of our people are on welfare. And what, what creates a problem with uh, most communities across Canada, since 70% um, of our community, communities on reserve are on welfare, is we created this welfare uh, state, this welfare society. And because of the welfare society, we, we just don't have the people able, the young people able to go to school able to um, you know get up in the morning because their parents aren't employed right so chances are even if uh, AFN is able to get like they did two years ago 800 million dollars from the federal government for an education improvements on reserve it doesn't matter if the if the community members if the kids you know if the adults can't wake their children up in the morning and get them to school so we we have a, a real problem and our philosophy is that in order to solve that problem, we need to get the family structure back. In order to get the family structure back, we need to get our family leaders employed. And in order to get them employed, we need them to participate in the natural resource industry, our biggest industry in Canada. <clears throat> if you said the green energy industry was the biggest industry in Canada, we'd be going after the green energy industry, but right now it doesn't exist. So we, we promote uh, natural resource industry. We advocate for them. We we go against um, legislation that uh, creates problems and more regulatory hurdles for uh, national corporations, uh, including mining, uh, tar sands or the oil sands, uh, including coal mining, met coal mining. We just promoted uh, met coal mining because of chiefs who are supporting the met coal mining in Southern Alberta. So we, we've done that sort of thing. We, we started a conference company, um, and basically, it's a, it's pretty much NCC is pretty much a conference company. We um, we had our first conference in 2018. We had 26 chiefs come out. We wrote a five five year business plan to um, access 100 pro development chiefs. Those are chiefs that support all industries, including oil sands and uh, med coal mining, those type of things. If the if a chief wants to join our group. Um, they have to approve or support all the natural resource industries. They can't, you know, support forestry and be against oil sands. So it's tough. We have to turn away some chiefs, um, but we think we we got a lot more than 100 across Canada. We think there are as many as 400 pro development chiefs who want to get their people employed. They see the opportunities there, right? You got Fort Mackay First Nation, who's probably the richest community in uh, Canada. You know, with all the First Nation people that work in the oil sands industry there, and it took them decades to transition from, you know, social welfare society to workers in the oil sands of business. So, I think uh, they're pretty proud of what they did, and we're trying to access that type of opportunity as best we can. In uh, 
in the fall of 2017, we decided to have our conference in Vancouver. Um, and it was really done in Vancouver because of the Trans Mountain situation. There were chiefs who supported Trans Mountain that wanted us, wanted us out there to promote the project as well. So we went out there and we had 62 chiefs at that conference with about uh, 200, maybe 250 um, industry proponents. We had the president of Shell out there. We were quite proud of that. The president of Suncor. In 2019, uh, in the fall of 2019, we had our biggest conference. We had 81 chiefs from uh, all over Canada, from across Canada. Uh, we only had uh, five of the 30 member chiefs from BC there because we they had a conflict with uh, Meet the Minister conference during that time. So we, uh, <clears throat> we were quite uh, um, happy about um, uh, getting the number of chiefs we got. We had about 450 industry representatives at the conference so it was our biggest conference and our uh, we had quite the um, big media coverage on it as well we had some four different uh, uh, media uh, agencies out there doing interviews during the conference our next conference is scheduled for september 20th in uh, calgary we're co-locating with the global energy um, summit or global energy yeah, Global Energy Summit, GES. Uh, we're working with them to uh, promote the um, um, participation of the new AFN chief this summer to come to our conference and the Prime Minister of Canada to come to our conference as well. So we're pretty excited about all that. And we're working um, uh, towards uh, getting our voice heard on the UNDRIP legislation. We're hoping that we'll be at the table for the action plan if and when the UNDRIP legislation does get passed. We don't believe UNDRIP legislation is good for Canada or good for the indige Indigenous peoples. It just offers more ambiguity, amb ambiguity to the system and uh, creates a uh, great opportunity for lawyers in my mind. I mean, Canada has created the biggest Indigenous law industry in the world. And it's because of the ambiguity in our constitution. It's because of the ambiguity in their treaties. It's because our rights and title have not been fully respected. And UNDRIP just doesn't do that. There's too many uh, you know, vague clauses in there, including free prior and informed consent. There's no real description on that. There's no real, real definition of who actually represents First Nations people in negotiations with the government and with industry regarding natural resource development. So we took the stance that um, <clears throat> reconciliation, since uh, Trudeau has always mentioned that UNDRIP is part of their uh, plan for reconciliation with First Nations peoples. Uh, we took that to heart and said, if you want real reconciliation, do what uh, your uh, uh, Royal Commission that was sponsored by your own party, the Liberal Party, back in 1996 under uh, John Chrétien, where the, that study, on Aboriginal peoples recommended that the government give to the First Nations 30% of all the land and all the resources that are owned by the federal governments. 90% of our land in Canada, uh, more than 90% of our land in Canada is owned by the federal government. So we think that they should realize upon that recommendation. And whenever we get in discussions with, um, you know, the Liberal Party or any, um, advocates for uh, reconciliation that are against, you know, the kind of uh, transfer of wealth like this, they always say, well, I mean, it'll come and go, but uh, uh, our First Nation people will not, you know, take care of it, but we will. I mean, you take, for example, the Alaskan tribal situation that occurred in 1971 in the United States. The Alaskan tribes did not have reserve land and were under, you know, a land claims, uh, a regime for decades. And in 1971, the US government agreed to establish what they called corporations, and give those 12 corporations uh, some 70 million acres of land in Alaska, including a, uh, a act that uh, required that every natural resource development that occurs in Alaska, 50% of it has to include indigenous participation from these 12 corporations. And a 13 corporation was later 
established in, in around 1978 or 1979 to protect the interests of um, Alaskan tribal members who did not live in Alaska. So it is 13 bills of Congress that provided so much access to economic opportunity to the First Nations that they thrived. And there was a clause in there that allowed them to sell this land. Any of those golf corporations, any of the people that own land uh, through those uh, 13 acts of Congress could actually sell their land and their resources to another American or another foreign power. But ever since 1971, none of those First Nations, none of those uh, corporations ever sold a acre of land because our people recognize the power of owner, ownership and land and resources. And we do our best to protect land and resources. You don't see um, articles or, uh, or uh, media posts about uh, big protests in Alaska because the First Nations protect the environment there. When uh, the Exxon Valdez went under, you know, you didn't hear about the First Nations complaining about that because they were doing the cleanup. So it's, it's this kind of thing that can work in Canada. And that's what we're trying to promote is some real reconciliation. Instead of giving us $20 billion a year for a social welfare society that's going nowhere, give us real opportunity and real ownership in the land and resources. So that's what we've promoted and that's what we promoted in the hearings for Untrip last Friday. <laughs>